Here's a second graphing example. This time I've taken it one step more complicated and I'm going to graph a rational function. And I'm going to do all the same stuff I normally do. The usual college algebra stuff and then the calculus stuff. Do everything by hand and then at the very end check my graph versus that of a computer and then label very well. So let's start first of all with well, I guess the easiest thing to first find out is the domain of such a thing. Or the first thing that you might want to find out. I'm going to factor 2 out of the numerator. So, I start with 2x squared minus 32 over x squared minus 1. I factored a 2 out of the numerator. I notice I have x squared minus 16, which is a difference of squares. So I can write the top as 2 times x minus 4 times x plus 4. And the denominator, the same thing is going on. x squared minus 1 factors as x minus 1 times x plus 1. And right away we can see the, intercept, the x-intercepts and the vertical asymptotes. Let's start with the domain. Since I have x plus 1 and x minus 1 in the denominator, the function is not defined when x equals plus or minus 1. So I can write that as negative infinity to negative 1, union negative 1 to 1, union 1 to infinity. Or you can, if you don't want to write all that, I would certainly allow you to write x does not equal plus or minus 1. To me they say the same thing. The range I don't know right off the top of my head. I have to wait until I get a graph of it. Uh, for the intercepts, start with the x-intercepts, as I usually do since the numerator factors as 2 times x minus 4 times x plus 4, I can see that plus and minus 4 are both zeros of the numerator, so my x-intercepts are going to be plus and minus 4 comma 0. The y-intercept, find that by setting x equal to 0, so let me go back to the function itself. 2x squared minus 32 over x squared minus 1. So if x is equal to 0, I'll end up with negative 32 over negative 1. So it'll be 32. So my y-intercept will be 0, comma, 32. And while I'm here, I just saw that my vertical asymptotes, VA, I'll call them VA, x, equals plus and minus 1. That's because the denominator has plus and minus 1 as zeros. And, and notice it, that it's, if I had an x plus 1 or an x minus 1 in the numerator, remember we'd have a hole in that spot instead of an asymptote. But nonetheless, I also have a horizontal asymptote. If you look, you may know this about rational functions, I don't know if you know it or not, but um, this 2 that's in front of x squared, since the degree of the numerator equals the degree of the denominator, the quotient of the leading coefficients is going to be the horizontal asymptote. And what I'm talking about is 2 over 1, or y equals 2, will be a horizontal asymptote. But a more calculus way to do it is to find the limit as x goes to plus or x goes to minus infinity. So I'll put ha. I know it's going to be 2, but I'm going to go through the, the trouble anyways. We're going to do the limit as x goes to infinity, 2x squared minus 32 divided by x squared minus 1. Now, if you remember the trick to these, if you factor out the highest power of x, so in this case it's x squared, this equals the limit. As x goes to infinity, I'll have uh, x squared times 
2 minus 32 over x squared. And then the denominator, I'll have x squared all over, or I mean times, 1 minus 1 over x squared. So I can cancel the x squareds and then allow x to go to infinity. And you'll end up with 2 minus 0 divided by 1 minus 0. So y equals 2 is an h a, an horizontal asymptote. You should also do this for x goes to negative infinity, but I'll tell you right now that it turns out to also be 2. And that has more to do with the fact that they're both even powers than anything else. So I've got horizontal, vertical asymptotes, x and y intercepts. This is about all the stuff you do for your college algebra material. Now let's move on to the calculus stuff. And let's see what the first derivative tells us. So let me rewrite the function f of x equals 2x squared minus 32 divided by x squared minus 1. So I'll take the derivative, f prime of x, and remember the quotient rule is what I'm going to use here. So I'm going to get the derivative of the numerator, that'll give me 4x, leave the denominator alone, x squared minus 1, minus now leave the numerator alone, so that's 2x squared minus 32, but take the derivative of the denominator, which will end up being 2x. And all of that is over x squared minus 1 squared. That's the quotient rule. So let me do some simplifying. Now, if you're going to use problems uh, later on, it's a good idea to simplify, even though I don't require it you'll find it almost impossible to do the rest of the problem unless you do actually simplify. So I'm going to start by multiplying the 4x through the x squared minus 1 and I'll get 4x cubed minus 4x minus. Watch the parentheses on this second part. A lot of people uh, forget the parentheses and get all the signs screwed up. For the second part I'm going to multiply through by 2x through the 2x squared minus 32. And in those parentheses, I'll get 4x cubed uh, minus 64x. And all of that is over x squared minus 1 squared. Now I see the 4x cubes cancel out. And it looks to me like I'm going to have negative 4x plus 64x to give me 60x. So I can see that I have three critical numbers. There is a 0 when x equals 0. So critical numbers, let me write them down. Uh, books seem to call these critical points. I hate that terminology because it implies an x and a y. Critical numbers are 0. That's where the numerator is equal to 0. And plus and minus 1. That's where the denominator is equal to 0. So I'll do a number line for that. This would be f prime. And I will plot on this number line 0, positive 1, negative 1. Notice I put little circles above those to indicate that the function's not defined for either plus or minus 1. So now I simply need numbers in between in all of these subintervals. Now the denominator, you should know, no matter what, the denominator is going to be a positive number because you are going to square it. And I've already taken out the possibility of the things that make it 0. So you can pretty much ignore the denominator when it comes to determining the sign of this thing because it's always positive it will take the sign of whatever the numerator is and the numerator is negative whenever x is negative that means I have a negative before negative 1 and I have a negative between negative 1 and 0 so the function goes down over those two intervals then 
60x is positive whenever x is positive. So anything after 0, I'm going to get positive. So it's increasing. Increasing. So it looks to me like 0, the number 0, is a local min, L min. The other ones are nothing because, well, the break in there indicates that you're decreasing before negative 1, then decreasing between negative 1 and 0. Let me find out what is that local minimum, the y value of it. And that's where you plug in f of 0. But we did that. We did that earlier in the problem when I found um, the y-intercept for the original function. It was 32. f of 0 equals 32. So 0 comma 32 is a local min. So that's all the stuff I can do with the first derivative. Oh, I should put, while I'm here, I should put where it's decreasing and increasing. So I'll put decreasing. on negative infinity to negative 1, union negative 1 to 0. It might seem sort of strange, but you don't want to include negative 1 in here because it's not doing anything at negative 1. And then it's increasing. On 0 to 1, union 1 to infinity. So there's some more stuff that I typically ask. Now we're ready for the second derivative. So let me rewrite my function. f of x was equal to 2x squared minus 32 over x squared minus 1. f prime of x was equal to 60x over x squared minus 1 squared. Remember, quotient rule, take the derivative of the numerator, so I get a 60, times x squared minus 1 squared. Now leave the numerator alone, so I get negative 60x times the, den the derivative of the denominator. You've got to use the chain rule. Remember, you're dealing with an inner function, an inner function, and an outer function. It, something squared is the outer function, so that 2 comes down. Then I have x squared minus 1 to the 1 power, then times the derivative of x squared minus 1. So I'll get a 2x there. All of this is over x squared minus 1 squared, but squared. So that'll be to the fourth power. Now this always happens with the second derivative in rational functions. You will get to factor out on x squared minus 1. So I will take x squared minus 1 and factor it out of the numerator. That will leave me with 60 times x squared minus 1. And the other piece, then I'll have minus, x squared minus 1 is gone, so I'll have 60x times 2, that's 120x, uh, times 2x would be 4x, 240x squared. And that's over x squared minus 1 to the fourth power. So I'll cancel out x squared minus 1. And let me simplify the numerator as much as I can. I'll get 60x squared minus 60 minus 240x squared. All of that is over x squared minus 1 to the third. And then I'm going to get negative 180 
x squared minus 60 all over x squared minus 1 to the third. And I'm going to go and factor out a negative 60 out of the numerator. So that'll leave me with negative 60 times 3x squared plus 1 all over x squared minus 1 cubed. Now for my critical numbers, for f double prime, those are the ones in the denominator that make the denominator undefined, plus and minus 1. They'll be there throughout the whole problem. And then anything that makes the numerator 0, but 3x squared plus 1 is not equal to 0 anywhere. If you try to set that equal to 0 and solve it, you'll get an imaginary answer. So, I only have two critical numbers for f double prime. They are negative 1 and 1, and I'll still put my uh, little circles over them to indicate I'm not allowed to plug in those numbers. And as I mentioned, here, if you look, the 3x squared plus 1 will always be a positive number, no matter what you plug in for x. So that negative 60 will make the numerator negative, no matter what x is. So I'm really going to get the information about the sign based on what I plug into the denominator. So remember, the numerator is always negative. For my test values, I'll try negative 2. Then between negative 1 and 1, I'll try, obviously, 0. And then after negative 1, or after 1, I'll try positive 2. All right, so one thing you ought to notice, too, this is an even function. So whatever happens on the left side of the graph is copied to the right side of the graph. If I plug in negative 2, I will get 4 minus 1. I'll get 27 in the denominator. Since the top is negative, that makes this negative, and we're concave down. Now if I plug in 0 for x, I will get, well, negative on top, but I will also get a negative in the denominator, so it will be positive, it will be concave up. And as I mentioned, you can copy what you did uh, before negative 1 to after 1, because it's an even function. So concave down, then up, then down. Do I have a point of inflection? I do not. Even though it changes concavity, after you go through negative 1, the fact is I'd have to have negative 1 actually be in the domain for it to make up a point. So there are no points of inflection. So I'll say no POIs, no points of inflection. However, um, I do have concave down, on the interval negative infinity to negative 2, union 2 to infinity, and concave up on negative 2 to 2. All right, so now I'm ready to sketch my rough sketch of this graph. Um, nothing fancy. Remember, I'll draw on, I'll have the computer draw a really good one. We had, first of all, we had intercepts. x was plus and minus 4. So I'll put those in. Negative 4. Positive 4. I had vertical asymptotes at plus and minus 1. Okay, then I had a horizontal asymptote, y equal 2. So I have to go through negative 4, plus I am, what is it telling me here? I'm going to go back to my f prime. I'm decreasing on negative infinity to negative 1 and from 
negative 1 to 0. So from negative infinity to negative 1, if I'm decreasing, let me put a dot at the negative 4. Since this is uh, y equals 2 is a horizontal asymptote, the graph will tend to that as x goes to negative infinity. And then the graph will hug close to the line x equals negative 1 as you approach negative 1 from the left. Now, between negative 1 and 1, I think I did have a local minimum. Where was it? A local minimum at 0, 32. Means my graph will have to be strangely organized, because I'm going to put my 32 way before it probably should be. 32. And it's a local minimum, so it's going up, which also matches the concave down from negative concave up from negative 2. Oh, I just just discovered a big error. Thank you. All those negative 2s need to be negative 1s. Or all the change every 2 to a 1. So we're concave up from negative 1 to 1, so it's going to go something like this. Remember, this is an even function, so I'm just going to copy this stuff to the other side. And so my feeling is I'll get a graph that looks something like this. And let me go ahead and bring in the computer generated version. So let me move this out of the way and bring in the computer one. Okay, here's the computer generated graph. And you can see that it does mimic mine negative or 0, 0.32. It's a local minimum. Here it is, 0, 0.32. That's a local min. Uh, we can see that it was concave down everywhere except in the middle where it was concave up. That follows what we said. I see that I've got an x-intercept at negative 4 and at 4. I got a horizontal asymptote of y equals 2 x equals negative 1, and then over here, x equals positive 1. One last thing I want to cover is the range. I almost forgot it, but I can throw it in now. It certainly looks from the graph that we're going to have the range stretch all the way down to negative infinity, going up to 2, not including 2. That's a horizontal asymptote. It's possible to cross those things. I'm going to check that afterwards. But then I do know that it then is union 32 to infinity, but I'm including 32 because we actually have the point 0, 32 on the graph. And from there it goes on up and up and up to infinity. Now to show you, to prove to you that 2 is not in the range, Suppose you set y equal to 2. So first, we note that no, y equals 2 is not in the range. So if you were to assume that y could actually be equal to 2 at some point, set y equal to 2 and replace y with 2x squared minus 32 over x squared minus 1. That, of course, would equal 2. Multiply through and get 2x squared minus 32 would equal 2x squared minus 2. Subtract the 2x squareds off of both sides and you end up with negative 32 equals negative 2. And that is a very serious contradiction.